we're going to start with a bit of political drama. Not that kind of political drama, don't worry. Jigsaw. We've had a problem in Java for a long time. We have jar hell. You're trying to use a project, and it uses another project, which uses another project, and all of a sudden, you're trying to figure out what you're using. Frameworks developed in order to solve this problem. So we've got Maven and Gradle. They do a decent job of solving the problem, or rather hiding the problem, but we never quite solved the problem. It's still with us. And the second problem never got addressed at all, which is using internal packages. You name your project, my company, dot internal, dot do not use, you distribute the jar, and all of a sudden you have 200 people using your private package. And now you're stuck with it forever. That's not so great. Java 9 finally solves this problem with modules. Well, sort of. Do you use any Sun internal APIs? Does anyone know? Maybe? This is the problem. We don't know, because it depends on all of the jars we depend on. Some pretty common jars do use the Sun internal APIs. So we're back to the problem of now 200 people don't use the API. Thousands or millions of people use the API. It's even better, despite the fact that it was labeled internal. So if you use a jar that does and don't even know it, woe behold you, because with Java 9 and modules, you no longer have access to this code. Obviously, this doesn't work, which is why Java 9 has been delayed so many times. There's been discussion as of late of, well, this isn't really a problem, because there's a command line flag that says, I want to operate in unsafe mode and be able to call private packages. Great, we've moved the problem to the future. The talk is, should this flag be the default? If it's not the default, people's code doesn't run out of the box. If it is the default, we've moved this problem to Java 10 when you want to turn off this flag by default. They're still hashing it out, and we'll find out soonish. Now, let's look at Jigsaw's release, because it's fun to see how many times they've attempted to release this product. The first discussion was with Java 7. I know, we're going to have a plan A and a plan B. Plan A, we're going to get it released with Java 7. Plan B, no worries, if we can't do that, we'll get it released with Java 8. We all saw that happen, we're using Jigsaw, and we lived, well, lived happily ever after. The end. No, nah, of course not. In 2012, they decided it wasn't going to be part of Java 8 either, but it was going to be part of Java 9. And the best part is it's so embedded in the Java 9 implementation that this time it has to happen. The sunk cost is too high to change their mind. In 2014, committed, it's going to be part of Java 9. We're now in 2017, so it's been a while. The first release date that anyone believed was possible for Java 9 was September 2016. Then May 2017. Then July 2017, I even wrote an abstract for this presentation exciting that it's going to come out next month. And now we're up to September 2017 with a question mark because it's changed so many times. Who knows? This talk is not about Jigsaw. I wanted to cover the politics because it's a current event, but there's a lot in Java 9 other than Jigsaw that's really exciting to be able to use. And we're going to take a look at those features today. Now, we could all use some sugar, syntactic sugar, to put in our coffee or to wipe out the bad memories of Jigsaw. Let's take a look at some of those today. First up is if you want to create a non-empty set in Java 8 or, well, or earlier for the first one, you can do it in one line. It's not that bad. You create an intermediate list or a stream, and you stick it in a set, and you declare your mission accomplished. This works. There's nothing wrong with this. The problem, however, is it's a lot of typing, and there's a lot of code that doesn't need to be there, so it's not so obvious what you're happening. Plus, it performs a little slower because you're creating one or more intermediate objects for no good reason. In Java 9, we have a bit of sugar to make this better. You can create a set in one line without any other objects. That's pretty nice. On a related note, this entire presentation is on SlideShare, so no need to take notes or pictures of everything that goes by. Get to focus on the content. So set of string, set of, and the list of arguments. That's nice. There are 11 method signatures, one through 10 parameters, and a var args in case you want to pass more. That allows the code to be optimized for the common case while still allowing you to create a zillion parameters in one line. Please don't do that, it's ugly. List has the same thing. It's less exciting for list because we've had arrays as list since the dawn of time. But it's nice to have a signature that parallels set so all of our collections are consistent with each other. 
And then we have a map. For a map, you pass the keys and the values. You can pass up to 10 pairs of keys and values. Just envision what that code might look like. Shutter. 20 parameters of a mix of keys and values. Not very easy to read. So again, we have a method that exists largely for consistency. Luckily, there's a better way. This is a map of the United States. It's in pretty colors. That proves there's a better way. No, seriously, though. You can call map of entries, which allows you to pass in those entry pairs of keys and values. It's very obvious looking at this code. You don't have to worry about your IDE messing up audio complete. You don't have to start counting and thinking whether something is a key or a value. It's just a pair. That's pretty nice. Now, I know none of these features are going to make your day and make you a hundred times more productive Java developer, but they're nice little conveniences. Just like the contains method and string back when it came out in Java 1.4, I started relying on it as soon as it existed because it was fun, but it was never a hardship to write things the old way. The next new feature that's sort of fun is not in the language itself, it's in the Java doc. If you want to look up the name of a class in the Java doc, it's pretty easy. You just go to the Java doc, you go to frames, and you choose the class you want. Now, what if you want to find the method in the Java doc? We all know how you do that. You Google it. It's true. In Java 9, they've improved the Java doc so that you can actually search for methods inside of the Java doc. This is nice. It's, you don't have to worry about specifying the version of the Java doc you want. You just go into the Java doc, you type what you want, and you see what you actually want to know, which is not what does Google think the sort method is. It's like these are the signatures of the sort method, and you can see at a glance which one you're interested in. You're not subject to, well, I found Java, um, the util sort method 100 times, but I didn't find the swing sort method because no one uses it. I have access to everything I need right here. So I have to say to the Java doc, welcome to 2017. Ajax search is a lovely feature. Try with resources was introduced in Java 7. Is it safe to assume everybody's familiar with the feature in Java 7? Is anyone not familiar? Okay, and the other half of you don't have hands. Good to know. Um, try with resources allows you to not have to write the finally block. You create your resource in the try with resources, you use it, at the end it's closed whether there was an exception thrown or not. This is nice, it's a little ugly, our try is two lines there. In Java 9, you can just put it in the try block and declare your object before the try block. This is nice, it allows us to more clearly specify what we're creating, in this case a reader, and it makes it very obvious where the try block begins and ends. Good feature, saves us a little time, saves us a little reading, and it works with anything that's effectively final. As background effectively final was introduced in Java 8, it's any variable that if you were to write final before it, the code would still compile. Now, first brain teaser of the morning. Why doesn't this work? Any ideas? Well, the, they are closed in auto, sort of, but you're close. Hmm? Um, it, it's not. Try with resources. It's smart enough to close things in reverse order, just like in Java 7, if you had declared all of these objects in the try with resources. So that's a good guess, but that's not the problem with the code. Um, PS is effectively final. There's no reassignment to PS. With effectively final, you are in fact allowed to call methods on it, which is what ps.setint is doing. So also a good guess, but not the problem. Um, you don't need the rs in the increment. Well, I don't use the result set anywhere, so that's not so great, but let's pretend I do. Th think about. You don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> Since JDBC 4, you don't have to load JDBC drivers. It happens as part of driver manager get connection. Yes, Victor got it. Go, Victor. Um, that, this code is a connection leak. That, that, that's a far greater problem than anything else because I've made the code pretty, but I've introduced a new problem. In Java 7 or Java 8, 
or properly written Java 9, the connection prepared statement and results that would be created in the try block. And if any of them failed, the other resources would be automatically closed. Here, I'm creating all three of these resources before try with resources ever executes. If I have an error creating the prepared statement or running the result set, say my SQL has a syntax error in it, it never gets to the try with resources, so it never closes my code and I have a connection leak. Not good. I use this example here because this is something that's really tempting to do. This is the use case for why you would want to use this new feature of try with resources and auto close and clean up the code. But what seems to be a simple refactoring is not. So the lesson here is beware. Yes. Ah, seats. So resource leak. Don't write code like this. Really important. The next new feature is the deprecated annotation. Has some new functionality to it. I really like these two quotes from the Java enhancement proposal, so I'm going to read them out loud. Very few deprecated APIs were actually removed, leading some people to believe that nothing would ever be removed. On the other hand, other people believe that everything that was deprecated might eventually be removed, which was never the intent either. This is a problem we have in Java, that things never ever go away. We get to have something that's deprecated since Java 1, and here we are 20-something years later, and it's still deprecated. Oracle is finally making headwinds on trying to solve this problem. The first thing they did is they introduced two new attributes to the deprecated annotation. The first one is for removal. Is the intent of this deprecated API that it eventually be removed? With some APIs, it's not. It, this is deprecated because there's a new and better way of doing it, but we recognize that the old way is still fine or that there's so much code using it, it's never going away. There's some code that is deprecated, this is dangerous, or it was only introduced temporarily, don't get too attached to it. So by being able to specify intent, we as developers have the information we need about should we be getting off of this deprecated code rather than ignoring it, which is the current state of affairs. The other new attribute in deprecated is since. When did it become deprecated? Has it been deprecated since Java 1.2, or did it just become deprecated in Java 1.9? Useful information to have. They did not go and update the since attribute on all of the existing APIs. If something was deprecated in Java 1.9, you definitely are guaranteed you will have a deprecated since Java 1.9. If it was deprecated before that, it depends on whether the code was touched and whether the developer touching the code felt like updating the annotation, which means some of them have it and some of them don't. So you can't rely on the sense attribute for older code. Now, you're probably thinking, wait a minute, I've seen version numbers in the Java doc. I don't know what you're talking about. And you have. We've had since, but we only had it for when an API was introduced. For example, regular expressions have been available since Java 1.4. Now we have it for both ends of the life cycle. When a method is born, it gets a sense attribute for when it was created. When a method is put to rest, it also gets a sense attribute. And we're going to call that good. In the code, you have a deprecated annotation. And in the Java doc, you have the same deprecated annotation. It's even expressed in annotation form, which is great. Now, we have our warnings. If you use deprecated code, you expect to get a compiler warning. And as we all know, you can suppress compiler warnings. Yay, ignore all the errors. Now, up until now, we've pretty much made a habit of ignoring deprecated code because we knew it was never going anywhere. Not so safe anymore. So now you can specify information about what type of deprecation you would like to ignore. So you can ignore all deprecation warnings, which is the current state of affairs. That's the last one. You can remove legacy deprecation warnings. Those are the deprecated APIs that nobody has expressed are going away. That's the first one. And you can, deprecate, you can suppress warnings for deprecated for removal. Please don't do that. Those are the important ones that you should care about. So is anything actually deprecated for removal? Yes, but the things that are deprecated for removal for the most part are things that nobody's actually using. There's some unused code in AWT. There's some old security APIs. There's some threading and runtime libraries that are really unpopular. I'm sure you're all riveted by the fact that these might go away someday. Not in Java 9 or 10, mind you, but one day we'll be rid of them. 
There are also some modules that were introduced for Jigsaw. Jigsaw groups packages into modules, so we have a new construct called a module. Some of them were introduced just for transition. This is a great use case of the for removal feature because they're telling you as soon as something is introduced that you should not get too attached to it because it's going away possibly as soon as Java 10. This is good to know when developing. It sort of solves the internal API problem in that not only is this internal, but it will be gone soon. You should not use it. I look forward to seeing in three years the people who are worried that these APIs are going away in Java 10 and say, someone should have told us, we didn't know. And there's one big one that's flagged as deprecated now, applets. However, sigh, they're not deprecated for removal. So we're still going to be with applets for a long time. I know, they were so close, they had the opportunity to finally put applets to rest and they didn't do it. Streams are my favorite feature in Java 8. And they've added four new APIs to the streams functionality in Java 9. The first one is take while. So think about how you'd print all the Fibonacci numbers less than 30. You could use a loop, that would be pretty easy. If you do it with streams, it's complicated because Fibonacci numbers are infinite. So you can't use a, a feature that's just gonna check the values and compare because it'll never end. So instead you have to do something like use an interim collection or, or start doing math in your head to figure out how many to limit the set to. It's, it's not ideal. Luckily it would take a while. It's really easy to write a Fibonacci calculator. You start out with iterate to generate an infinite sequence or an infinite stream rather. And you start pairing up the values, counting and summing them up. With the map, we're just getting the values so that we get the Fibonacci number out of this. And take a while is where the magic happens. Take a while is saying, get the largest matching stream you can from the beginning until you no longer get matches. So here we have take a while the Fibonacci numbers are less than 30 and print them out. This is great. It does exactly what we want and it's a useful feature to have available to us. We're now starting to think about how we can deal with finite streams and infinite streams in the same space. It does assume you have an ordered stream because it's looking for the longest list or sequence in a row. If you have a randomly ordered stream, that's not likely to happen, in which case the behavior is undefined. Just like take while, we have a drop while. So we could use drop while to print all the Fibonacci numbers greater than 30. Any ideas why that won't work? Right, I don't want to list all the Fibonacci numbers later, greater than 30 for you because that would take the whole conference and beyond. So this does not work. It, logically, it's good. It says I want the ones greater than 30, but we've got the infinite stream problem. If you were to add a limit to this, it would work. If I said maybe limit 20 or limit 100, then I make it a finite stream and I no longer have that problem. And it does take care of dropping the beginning ones for me. Of course, filter would do the same thing. So the key here is that take while and drop while, while they appear to be mutually exclusive and counterpart each other, not so much in the real world. What does work with infinite streams is a new attribute that's available on iterate. Right now, if you want to do a countdown, counting down from 10, ready to blast off, you have to add a limit because we don't want to have an infinite stream. And this works. It does, in fact, print 10 numbers, but it requires a great deal of thought and invites, invites an off by one error. If I'm looking at this, does it end at one or zero? I can figure it out, but it's not immediately apparent looking at the code. We want our code to be very readable, so I'd have to add a comment, and then I'd have to hope that the comment stayed the same as the code forever, <laughs> like that's gonna happen. The new functionality allows you to actually express intent. So here, I wanna get an infinite stream, it's not infinite, starting with 10, and I want to keep counting down, but I want to stop when i stops being greater than zero. So now it's really obvious to me what's going on here, and to anyone reading the code, it's hard for me to mess it up, and I don't have to worry about the math that happened with the limit to make sure that I have the right number of values. I also don't have to know what the right number of values is if I have a more complicated formula than subtracting by one. So that's pretty cool. The fourth stream method is of nullable. Of nullable is fun. Right now in Java 8, if you're creating a stream with one object in it, you have to be careful that that object isn't null. If you do, it's great. If you're not careful, it throws a null pointer, which means you have code that looks a lot like this. 
you get a dubious object back from an API, you curse the developers of that API for returning null, and then you have a null check where you say, all right, fine, if it was null, I want an empty stream, and if it's not null, I want to create a stream that consists of that object. This works, it's just a lot of code. Of nullable is far easier. If you get in the habit of using of nullable, you don't have to worry about whether dubious object is null, you just know that I now have a safe stream, just like we do with optional. When we're working with optionals in Java 8, we don't sit around scratching our heads, well, do I need to know whether they return null or not? We don't care. We call the proper optional method and we're good. And the same thing here with streams now. All four of these APIs have something in common. They solve a frequent developer problem with using the new streams API. And unlike the date API, it doesn't take three tries in order to have an API you can use. They got streams pretty much right on the first try. They made some minor tweaks to it on the second try, and we're good to go. I look forward to seeing what they add in Java 10, because now that we don't have these problems anymore, I'm sure we'll be inventing new ones. JShell. Has anyone used the REPL in Java 8? Just me. You're not missing anything. It was horrible. In Java 9, they've improved it greatly. What happens in Java 8 is they introduced a REPL, or read, evaluate, print loop, for a language called Nashorn. Nashorn was an interesting mix of Java and JavaScript in that it didn't match the syntax for either. It also didn't match the general expectations you'd have of a REPL. So if you're sitting around coding in Perl or Python or Ruby or anything else, you expect certain things to happen. If you tab, you expect autocomplete. If you press the up arrow, you expect to see the code that you typed on the previous line. And neither of those happened in Java 8. The other thing that didn't happen in Java 8 is they didn't give you common packages. Ooh, does everyone know what, what package path is in? Because for a quick prototype, it just rolls off the tongue to start typing, right? Com dot, uh-oh, wait, what comes next? I don't know that, and path is one of my favorite APIs. This made the REPL effectively useless because you had to look up information. If I have to look up what package something is in, I would be better off in my IDE instead of in a command line tool where I have to know the package. Java 9 fixes all of this. Tab works, the up arrow works, and all of the APIs that I commonly use are known to JShell. They also retrofitted it for Nashorn, so now you can use it um, at least with tab and, and the up arrow. Still doesn't know about the packages, though. So they have improved it, and we've got an example here where we are using streams, and you can see I just went into JShell. I didn't type in any packages. I didn't tell it where stream was. And I didn't do anything funky to try to convince JavaScript that it was Java so I could do a prototype. So this is nice. It's pretty equivalent to my IDE. If I don't have an IDE handy, maybe I'm on a server, I can imagine using this. If I'm on my computer, I can't imagine using this. I have a nice class in every IDE I use on every computer I use entitled play test, and it has a main method. And I put code in the main method, and I do my test there. So I think the real world applicability of this is fairly low, because most of the time we're developing on a computer that does, in fact, have the tools that we like. But it's nice to know that it's practical now. We have options. Before, we didn't have options. Or rather, we had a good option and a crappy option that you would never use. There are a few other random changes that were added into Java 9. But before I go into those, I want to see if there are any questions on anything that I've said so far. Trick, count to 10 when asking for questions so that if somebody is deciding whether they have a question, they have time to ask. OK, still no questions. Oh, question. Yeah, there's no Elvis operator. You need Groovy for that. Um, you, you've got filters, so you can filter out your nulls. You've got of nullable, so you have an empty stream and not a null. Um, you've got optional, so if you've got only one object available to you, you don't have to worry about null. It'll just pass it along as you go. I haven't had a ton of problems with nulls. I have had this problem that of nullable fixes, where I have an object that got returned from an API that really should have just returned an empty list and returned null. But for the most part, I don't have a lot of nulls. It's not a big deal. Any other questions? Are there any extremes by chance that we should maybe say how you're an executor or something that is swallowed runtime exception? That's kind of hard error to debug. Did I 
Yeah. That sounds a little like, is there a feature that does magic? Really? I can't think of one. Uh, so Maybe in Java 10? Okay. Uh, no. Any other questions on anything I've talked about so far? The executors of the parallel streams. That works the same way it did in Java 8. They haven't changed anything in Java 9. Good question, though. That's a space that I could definitely envision some useful changes in. Any other questions? OK. And we proved that counting to 10 works, because I got a question on 9 the first time. So we've got some random other changes in the language. These are not changes that you're likely to care about, but it's fun to know what they added and that they're available. You can have private methods in an interface. I know you're probably all sitting there thinking, why on earth would I want to do that? This is useful for the same reason the default methods are useful, for API designers. If you've got an API that has an interface, you've had it since the dawn of time, you want to add a method to it. So you're adding a default or a static method to it. How long is your method going to be? Could it, should it be a 1,000 lines? Because we don't want to add a public helper method, someone might call it. Now we've got a problem that we've put a method in an interface that we don't want to support. We can't put it in a package because packages are public, except with Jigsaw, which is interesting. Now that they've added this feature, we don't need it anymore. So what they did is you can have a private method. So you can have, as part of your API, the default or static public method that everyone can call and a private method that has your helper logic in it and is local and exactly where you want it to be. Useful feature if you're an API designer, 99% of us will never need to use it. They've changed the rules for what can be a legal identifier, so what can be a method name or a variable name. You can still have an underscore in your name, so underscore temp is fine. You can't have just an underscore. Yes? If you have a private method declared in the interface, do you increase the visibility of the implementation? It, it's not increasing the visibility. It's adding a new method with that signature because the private method is hidden and local to the method, to the interface, rather. It's just like having a private method in a superclass. You have another method in the subclass that happens to have the same name. That's fine, but there's no relationship between them. It can't be implemented. Well, not it can't be. It can be implemented, but it has no relationship to the private method, just like now. So it really is private. Or static methods, right. Which is why 99% of us will not care. And that's why it's on a slide titled Random Other Changes rather than, hey, look at this cool feature you're going to use. Because everything before I ask for questions, at least there's a chance that somebody in this room is going to use these features, I'd be shocked. But it's fun to know these things exist. Never know. So the underscore. I, I know you're all worried about your code that uses underscores as variable names. I'm pretty sure this change only involves certification book authors like me. Speaking of which, where's my bag? Did it get stuck? Still going around? OK, great. So we're going to draw a winner soon. I suspect this half of the room has a strong advantage in winning a book. Um, Sun miscellaneous unsafe was replaced by var handle. Um, I, well, I can't imagine needing to use this. It, I can't imagine it being useful for low-level APIs. So I suspect that some of the people who work at companies that have turned Java into C++ might find this useful. I'm not going to attempt to talk about it. So just FYI, your API has upgraded and moved to one that does not have unsafe in the name. And now you're allowed to use it. Progress. And this is a perfect example of the internal thing. They didn't even name it internal. They named it unsafe. And then we're surprised that people are using it. If you give people an API, they're going to use it. There's an annotation called save var args. This one's rare unless you're doing API design, in which case it's pretty common. This is what happens when you try to mix generics and var args. If I have a list of string dot, 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 I'm going to get a warning that tells me that the compiler can't guarantee safety here. Because from its point of view, I now have an array of objects. Sort of problematic there. Now you can use it in addition to static and final methods. You can also use it on private instance methods. Now, it's useful change, but it's not a huge change because the methods were private in the first place, so you've just informed yourself that a class isn't safe. And your teammates, so no harm in that. There are some other APIs as well. Um, there are four new APIs on the flow class and a bunch of new process APIs. Unlike the random changes slide, 
these APIs are useful. I haven't done any reactive development, so rather than pretend to be an expert on these changes, I'm just showing them to you. And we can ask somebody like Victor, who's been doing some reactive programming about them during the break or the open space. And with that, are there any other questions? Yes, I'm sure Oracle has a strategy. Oracle, as a very commutative company, has not shared that strategy with anybody. And the secret company I work for is not Oracle, so I have no wisdom there. Um, on a personal note, though, I, they've made a lot of changes. So while Java releases have been slower lately than they have in the past, they've had a lot in them. Java 7 gave us paths and try with resources and a lot of new APIs. Java 8 gave us streams. Java 9 will eventually give us Jigsaw. These are all pretty substantial changes to the language and show a good commitment for moving it forward. So while Oracle hasn't been that great on the Java Enterprise front lately, in fact, they said at a conference years ago that we're following what Spring does, which I think is awesome for the leaders of Java to say that's their strategy. Um, they didn't name Spring. They said, we're going to see what the other major dependency injection frameworks are doing and then copy their best practices. Like, hey, it's Spring. Uh, but I think with Java SE, they are focused on learning from each other and others and really engaging the community. In fact, that's why part of why Java 9 is taking so long, that rather than Oracle saying, all right, we're just moving, let's go with this, they are getting consensus from everybody and they're making sure that people are ready, that Eclipse is ready, that Maven is ready, that JBoss is ready, and that all the stakeholders are finally grudgingly, willingly ready when it goes live and it works successfully. Other questions? Right, that's why we were delayed from July to September. Excellent question. What happened, there was a vote, and those two were the big ones. There were a couple of other small companies that also voted no. No does not mean no, though. No means not now. Um, they, they fully understand that this is coming. What they're saying is no, we're not ready. And that whole discussion about should that flag be the default that I alluded to earlier came out of that. Of, okay, we're not ready now. What do we need to do in order to get ready? Unfortunately, as with any situation, there was some politics involved with that. My favorite vote was a company that voted yes and wrote in their comment for why. I hope, I sincerely hope, something is paraphrased, but I sincerely hope that all the parties involved in this will sit down and talk to each other rather than sniping at each other through open letters on the internet. So that was a nice, come on, we're not five, talk to each other already comment. But it was needed and it worked, and the parties are talking to each other again. So I don't know if it's going to be September or December, but it's coming. Um, they understand that it's happening. They understand that they need to be ready. And the nice thing about competition is if they're not ready, someone else is going to be. And WebSphere is not going to let their market share go down by making a statement that we don't support Jigsaw. They just can't. <laughs>